In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. I guess my lifelong fascination with ancient Rome began when I started um, high school, secondary school. I was at a Catholic school, it was called St Joseph's, um, in Pascoe Vale in Melbourne, uh, Australia. It was a well-respected Christian Brothers College, which I would attend for six years prior to doing a degree course in marketing at Melbourne University. Um, Form 1, which is the first year of high school, um, for the first two years, my fellow students and I were all forced to take two core courses. One was Biblical Studies, and the other was the Latin, believe it or not, teaching us how to read, write, speak Latin. And these were not electives. You didn't have a choice. You had to do them. And it's kind of like how the Catholic education system continues on their brainwashing program to turn you into a the cult of Catholicism. <clears throat> but throughout these, the two courses, Biblical Studies and, and Latin, the thing that I, I thought was most fascinating was it was all about ancient Rome. You know, there was the Caesars, there was the gladiators, there was the slaves and um, life in ancient Rome. So it was kind of like a history lesson um, while we were learning about the Bible and everything, because it's mostly, you know, the Old Testament and or time in Rome. And that probably became the catalyst for a lifelong fascination um, with world history. Rome was where it all started, and it's still today one of my favorite cities to go to. There was once an eternal city, and that was Rome, Bella Roma. In the fourth century AD, Rome was the most exceptional of all the cities of the Mediterranean. It was the shining emblem of an empire with a population of 90 million people, almost who lived and died under the rule of the Caesars. And this represented at that time half the population of the known world. So Rome was the center of everything. The Eternal City is the capital of Italy and it's regarded as one of the world's most beautiful and historic cities. And it's been a hub of power and politics, culture and civilization for more than 2,500 years of its recorded history. Now legend and myth and traditions surrounds the story of the city's founding with the two orphans, Romulus and Remus, who were reared by a she-wolf. And as the years went by, lots of important monuments, palaces, religious structures were built in the city, which now serve as stunning tourist attractions and unmissable relics of this illustrious past. Walking through the ancient parts of Rome, which is all the city center, is like walking through an ancient theme park on some Hollywood backlot only it's real, so, so real you can taste it. And as you venture out in the historic city, 
there are different, you know, incredible attractions almost at every turn. So what are some of these unmissable attractions in Rome? I'll take you through a few of the ones that stand out to me. The first one is my personal favorite attraction in Rome. To most people, it's the Colosseum, but to me, it has to be the Pantheon. The building suffered some damage in, in the fire, but it's since been rebuilt and has been well maintained ever since. The dome of the establishment, also known as the Basilica de Santa Maria, is made of a strengthened concrete and has a diameter spanning over 43 meters. But the biggest draw for many tourists is the incredible feat, the engineering marvel, which, which is the oculus. You might wonder what is so fascinating about that. Well, as the day goes on, the inside of the Pantheon transforms into a massive sundial. And when sunlight enters via the oculus, it's as if the wall is telling a time. So this is absolutely something to keep in mind and, and look out for when you go into the building. But let's take a deeper look, a deeper look than most of the guides will take, take you through. The Pantheon stood as the temple to all gods. It has stood for 2000 years and it deploys its 43 meter diameter dome, weighing 4,535 tons which I'm told is the equivalent of 16 Airbus 380s. And what were the secrets of its construction? Its architecture is just extraordinary. No such thing had ever been seen before in antiquity. And the Pantheon is about the absolute maximum height the Romans ever achieved or reached with their engineering feats. Never did they attempt a vault bigger and more ambitious than that. So let's take a look at the Pantheon and what they achieve the impossible with this unique monument. Probably the most complete and best preserved in all of antiquity. The Pantheon, its architecture is extraordinary. No such thing had even been seen before in antiquity. It was a gigantic environment in which space and light dominated with this circular shape completely original, which has subsequently been copied so many times and in Renaissance buildings. Like in, in Paris, there's a Pantheon, but the one in Rome is the original. <clears throat> it's situated on the Piazza della Rotunda in the historic heart of Rome. And the Pantheon reflects a desire to welcome all the religions of the empire. When you think about it, the Pantheon has to be a marvel of architecture because it's been standing for over 2,000 years. It all starts with a novel plan, the temple in two parts that reconciles two types of construction, two different forms, one rectangular and one circular. And this had never been seen before. And what's striking about the Pantheon is it's an architectural feat that's clearly designed to provoke surprise. So we first see it's a temple, there are the columns, and we barely see the dome behind. Then when you enter, it becomes something completely different revealed. Now, the design of the Pantheon is, is especially innovative because of its circular form. And not only for its shape and its plan, but also above that, for the roof has this extraordinary dome which, which holds up all of it on its own and it symbolizes the celestial vault, the home of the gods. It weighs 5,000 tons. So how did the Romans build such a spectacularly high vault? The dome of the Pantheon must have been built in several stages. First of all, they built a framework of wood whose layout corresponded to the future segments or casings. The second stage would have consisted of building a thin layer of vaulting composed of ribs made of bricks and mortar. And then the third step was to manufacture and install a negative framework inside each of the casing. And then they merely had to fill in with concrete, 
thus revealing the result without any of the framework. Now the dome has 140 cases or cells and these have been deliberately offset to increase the effect of perspective on the visitor and add to the height of the temple, making it even more impressive. To harden the concrete, they poured that into box moulds and formed a very solid base. The fourth step was to reinforce the dome with a skeleton of brick arches. The higher it rises, the lighter is the mortar, incorporating more putzolana, which is the abundant volcanic stone, which is as light as pumice. And the dome will be then finally covered with concrete. It's a construction principle that allows the load borne on the outer part of the vault to overhang it. And it transmits the pressure back to the lateral pillars that they covered the building and then they covered the building with a skin of marble or stucco veneer inside and tiles on the outside. I wouldn't say you would call much of their architecture beautiful or refined or pretty. I mean, it's solid and it, it obviously has been solid because its business-like structure has withstood 2,000 years of rain, hail, sunshine. The daylight used in, in the inner auditorium area is used with such brilliant theatrical skill by the opening of the summit to form an oculus or eye and it's nearly nine meters in diameter and it allows the light follows the course of the sun during the day giving the impression that the dome is rotating to the rhythm of time or seeking perhaps to res restore the divine mystery that's coming from above the building the building techniques that the Romans used were in large part learned from the Greeks. You know, architectural innovations went hand in hand with the ancient marvels of engineering, just like the pyramids of Egypt. And it's at the Colosseum, the most visited monument in all of Italy, that they started to go underground. And there were a multitude of passages. There were 28 lifts for animals. And one can only imagine what truly grand spectacles the games of the Colosseum were. The spectators were even sheltered by, from the sun by a giant awning, 50 meters high, that covered an, an oval area of 500 meters. It's unthinkable. Rome was founded 28 centuries ago in central Italy. It was 30 kilometers from a maritime outlet on the side of seven hills. And it's considered the cradle of Western civilization, maybe the second cradle after Athens. And Rome is the most populous city in all of Italy and has nearly five million inhabitants within its urban areas. Rome is also the third most visited city in the world with more than 10 million people visiting it each year. And on one hand, because it's the only city in the world that contains within it a state of its own, the Vatican city-state is subject to the authority of the Pope that attracts Christians of all nations. And because of the city's own archeological heritage, which is so grandiose, there are so many ancient monuments all of them both artistic and technical marvels of achievement. One wonders how did the Romans or the ancient Romans nearly 3,000 years ago achieve such feats? No surprise, the greatest attraction in all of Rome, probably all of Italy, is the Colosseum. And it's located on the Piazza del Palazzo. And it's one of the most prominent monuments, not only in the Eternal City, entire world. This stunning stadium is also known as the Flavian Amphitheater and when it was built it could hold 50,000 spectators. Its massiveness is truly enthralling to see in person and the fame lies not only in the building but its impact on Roman life. It stands as a reminder of the old gladiator battles and those glory days at the center of the old Roman indulgence, its place 
the emperor, his cohorts would watch from. The people of Rome would come to see their different events. And you cannot say you've been to Rome if you haven't gone and marveled at what's left of the Colosseum. So the Colosseum is quite literally the emblem of an eternal Rome. It's a unique testimony to the techniques and the modernity of the Roman builders. And at more than 50 meters high, it's impressively high and took its builders 100,000 cubic meters of white stones. And the biggest amphitheater of them all was designed in the first century AD under the emperor Vespasian and still stands in the heart of the city. Six million people a year go there to visit it. And it rem it's an oval amphitheater that remained in use for 500 years. And again, as I said, it housed 50,000 spectators, which is remarkable because even today, the biggest soccer stadiums on the planet, you know, many of them are lucky to, to have the capacity for 50,000 people. And the Colosseum was a place of spectacle for the Romans. It occupied such a unique part of their culture, keeping everyone together. Its front columns are a real catalogue of the three styles of Greek styles, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. And the Colosseum took eight years to build, with another two years for just the finishing touches. So how did the Romans build such a complicated, massive project in such a short time? Well, the building was built so quickly because of two reasons. First, thanks to using concrete as a construction material. For example, the Colosseum's foundations are an extraordinary feat, a huge concrete ring, the, the large and low paid workforce. Price was also a factor. And the result is gigantic constructions built in relatively short term time. From the latest archeological excavations, we know that the Romans had envisaged a system of pipes under the Colosseum that both brought in and evacuated large volumes of water, some several thousand cubic meters. This water could be used to assist in the creation of some of the spectacles. And once the pipes had been laid, the foundations were set in place. And there are giant foundations that are kind of ring thick, which the structure then sits. It's incredible. A huge concrete ring, about six meters thick, and that's its core base. On the other side of the ring, we have found two brick walls, 12 meters high by three meters wide, into which they poured the concrete. Then on an axis rotating from the center of the arena, the stone pillars were erected. Like the Greeks, the Romans used hoisting machines for their big constructions. The texts on architecture by the famous Roman architect Vitruvius, yes, that's the guy Leonardo da Vinci quoted, the Vitruvian man, provides some records of the loads lifted by these machines. Most of the Roman texts on building have gotten lost in time. And the only remaining text on architecture is just one by this architect Vitruvius. And that's all we have. And this knowledge has been condensed down and come through this and it's the single text. He might have not even been the greatest writer or the greatest architect, but it's the only record we have today. At ground level, there were 76 numbered passages for the ordinary uh, Roman spectators to enter. And the remaining four were preserved for the elite, you know, the, the members club. On the upper level are 80 vaulted arches, all molded and identical. And as I said, more than 50,000 spectators could attend these shows. They even had engraved tokens that were used as tickets that meant when people arrived at the Colosseum, they had a specific token with a number on it for the entrance so they didn't just go anywhere. Also, it had the number of the arcade, the staircase, the row of the bleachers, and even the seat. The Romans once or twice had experience with riots in the amphitheater, so that they were very aware of crowd safety and evacuation quickly. With its bleachers, its corridors, its stairs, its numerous entrances, the Colosseum was every bit as functional 
as our current day stadiums, even with their security. First of all, because it's built on a hollow structure, so you have a whole kind of circulation system that is big and wide, and so it means if there's trouble, you can evacuate people quickly. It could take as little as five minutes to get 50,000 people out if there was an incident. So measuring it, the Colosseum is 188 metres long by 156 metres wide and nearly and over 50 metres high. It is huge and no other Roman amphitheatre was ever built in such a scale. And it was at the Colosseum that the Romans put on the biggest spectacles and shows that were ever imagined. There was a complex backstage, there was a complex series of galleries, hundreds of people working in the shadows. There were elevators, gladiators, beasts, all took part in these shows. It was a massive, massive production. The people were all wild about these shows. Nothing at the time was as popular with all the stunts and the fighting gladiators, you know, fighting to the death. Kind of reminds you of a, the attraction that the UFC has today. It was men fighting against wild animals. And they were up against lions, against tigers, against elephants, even against sea creatures. It must have been bonkers. At midday, they would take advantage of the animals being there to carry out some executions. So rather than just being hanged or beheaded, the condemned were devoured by the wild animals. And this time, they couldn't fight back because they were tied up and they're unarmed. And then in the afternoon, it was the gladiators' turn where they would fight, normally end up in an injury or death, and it always took place with a referee and there were pairs. One gladiator enter, or two gladiators enter, one gladiator leaves. In an arena where a giant stage was 86 meters long and 54 meters wide and 4.5 meters high, there was an underground part of the Colosseum that was divided by a main axis. And we can still see the network of galleries and how the basement of the Colosseum is like Swiss cheese, made up of passages and rooms for storing maintenance equipment. It was the backstage of the shows, of passages and rooms, and the arena was covered with a layer of sand about 20 centimeters thick. And it featured in places moving plates designed to release from below a multitude of stage effects, which would thrill the crowd to see wild animals or gladiators appear, rise and appear out of as if from nowhere. And this wonder was made possible thanks to the concealed lifts in the underground part of the Colosseum, known as Hippogia, where a warrant of passengers and 28 elevators for the animals, each in a wooden cage measuring one meter by 80 by one meter 40, and one meter high, which would weigh up to 500 kilos. And these things could support loads of up to 300 kilos. It took eight men to lift one of these lifts seven meters. Can you imagine? The beast would then make a surprise entrance up the slope and into the arena. They might be lions or panthers or sometimes bears. Just imagine what an incredible spectacle it would be to see one of these giant 300 kilo carnivores appearing out of nowhere, all angry and ferocious. And some of the spectacles depicted episodes from mythology in which somebody died, and the person who died was unfortunately somebody who had been sentenced to death. There was a lot of death, death in the afternoon. That was um, one of Hemingway's books talking about bullfights, but you can imagine there was a lot of death in the afternoon at the Colosseum. The ingenious stage machinery meant scenery seemed to appear out of nowhere. And these platforms could often hoist up fake mountain rocks or trees to suddenly create a whole sort of um, Broadway show set. Um, Emperor Titus was famous for ordering 100 days of games in a row. And he sacrificed 5,000 wild animals on the day of the Colosseum's inauguration. <laughs> At the center of this deadly spectacle, one man, a famed beastmaster, 
or bestiarius, charged with facing 20 wild beasts, one after the other. To the east of the Colosseum stood the largest gladiator school in all of Rome, and it was directly connected to the Colosseum by an underground tunnel. And this prestigious school was called Ludus Magnus. And today, a part of the arena that was used to train the gladiators still stands, as does a few of the rooms that we used. The Ludus could accommodate 3,000 spectators around the arena, and there's 14 rooms to be seen. Presumably, they served as accommodation. And the gladiators were either slaves or enlisted free men. And there's no doubt that to, to be present at the gladiators training session was a massive privilege. They were idolized as much as the, the soccer players of today. And to heighten an aura of mystery, the gladiators from the school secretly entered the backstage of the Colosseum through this tunnel. Ludus Magnus is just one example of the incredible number of infrastructures to ensure that the great shows of the Colosseum would work their incredible magic. Archaeologists have since unearthed another three gladiator schools. Um, also close to the Colosseum was a morgue, an armory, and the storage buildings for sets and stage machines um, for the battles. The Roman Forum, also called Forum Romanum in Latin, is a rectangular plaza in the middle of Rome that is encircled by the remains of numerous significant ancient government structures. And this area was formerly a marketplace which was known to the ancient city residents of Forum Magnum, or just the Forum. It evolved naturally and gradually over many centuries in contrast to Rome's imperial fora. The Forum served as the hub of daily life in Rome and for many years serving as the location of triumphal processions, elections, public speeches, criminal trials, gladiatorial contests, and the focus of business activities here were statues and monuments honoring the noble citizens of the city. It's also referred to as the, the bustling center of ancient Rome and the most famous gathering place in all of human history. Are you curious to know where the marvelous creation of Rome began? If you go to Palatine Hill, and that's the place to visit. Palatine Hill, Ormans Palatinus in Latin, is one of the seven hills of Rome and one of the most important in the city's history. It's here, it's said, is where Romulus created Rome. It's also the spot where emperors chose as their home to emphasize this symbolic connection with Rome's creator and thereby the legitimacy of their power. The hill is also one of the oldest areas of the city and is sometimes referred to as the original nucleus of the Roman Empire. According to findings from archaeological excavations, people have been re residing in the region since the 7th century BC. The location now is mostly used as a sizable outdoor museum and the Palatine Museum is home to the many artifacts retrieved from this and other ancient Italian locations. This macabre destination and its fascinating history is known in Italy as the Catacomb di Roma and was where all the early Christians buried their deceased. Rome's catacombs are some of the oldest in the world. There are at least 40 of them. Some of them were only recently rediscovered for anyone and for anyone whose interest lies in the history, this is a place not to miss. It also has some of the most precious collections of Christian artwork in the world, and it contains numerous early Christian sculptures and fresco samples from before 400 AD, as well as gold medallions. The catacombs, however, are frequently inaccessible at times, um, just like many of the other historical places in Rome. If you're in Rome, a trip to the historic Spanish steps is is something you have to do. Francesco de Sanctis created the staircase in 1723, which ascends a precipitous slope between the Piazza Trinita Monti and the top, and the Piazza di Spagna at the rear. You may find the steps really familiar, 
because it's been often featured on television all the way back to the 1953 film Roman Holiday with Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. The Spanish steppes are a popular destination for most artists, painters and poets to visit. So if you're looking for some place to find some inspiration, to find your creative mojo, putting your easels on the top of the steps and dabbing away could be a, a good spot. In addition, throughout May and April, in the spring, the city erects or puts up lots of azalea pots for, with these beautiful bursting colours um, and it makes for a fantastic photo opportunity. Now Rome has a lot of churches, a lot of chapels, but there is nothing like the Sistine Chapel. And it's a popular portion of the Vatican Museum complex. It's, it's actually one of the most famous religious chapels in the world, boasting an astounding level of detail and iconography. The chapel is located in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican City and was extensively refurbished in the 1400s. It now serves as the site of the papal conclave when a new pope is chosen. The Last Judgment painting by Michelangelo is there and the ceiling artwork, again by Michelangelo, um, makes up one of the most extraordinary experiences if you are an art lover, historian in all the world. Meanwhile, in the Vatican, the Vatican Museum um, is which, where Pope Julius II founded in the early 16th century. And it displays an artwork that is a, the Catholic Church has amassed over time. The museum is also found within the Vatican City and is situated near the River Tiber. It has one of the largest art collections in the world and is housed there amongst some of the most important spaces in terms of art including Raphael's frescoes, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. The museum has approximately 70,000 works, of which 20,000 are shown. And post-COVID, it is a place to be seen. Another attraction inside the Vatican City is St. Peter's Basilica. The Basilica is a Renaissance-style church constructed between 1506 and 1626. It's, the Basilica is spacious enough to hold 20,000 people and is one of the largest domes in the world. It was created by various architects uh, and artists, including the famous Michelangelo. The dome can be seen from many parts of Rome and visitors can actually climb to the dome's top and check out the incredible scenery out of Rome. And you need to climb 500 steps and in a quite dark, narrow stairwell. So if you are chronically claustrophobic, you might want to go and do something else. Piazza Navona Square was built in 86 AD by Emperor Domitian who wanted a new stadium for chariot races and naval battles. He chose the area we now know as Piazza Navona as the most suitable and proceeded to create an enormous, impressive stadium, not completely different from the shape of the Circus Maximus. And while the square has had numerous changes over the centuries, if looked at carefully, it's possible to see the original shape and the plan of a circus the square is decorated with a breathtaking church and one of the most dazzling fountains in all of Rome. Once Rome's second largest bathing facility, the baths could accommodate a significant number of people at one time. And what is left of a once popular social meetup are brick walls and enormous vaults that have crumbled, yielding to the years of wear. It dates back to the third century with an intricately designed spa complex that held gymnasiums, libraries, and beautifully elaborate gardens within its premises. The baths, which formerly covered a space of 33,000 square meters and had numerous paintings and substantial granite columns, served as a tribute 
to Rome's outstanding architectural achievements. Although the majority of the beautiful architecture has collapsed and beyond identification, the structure has still stands as a grand and important piece of history. The Fontana di Trevi, probably the most famous fountain in all the world, um, immortalized in Fellini's film La Dolce Vita and many others. The Trevi Fountain is relatively new when compared with Rome's other numerous historical buildings. It was built in 1732 by architect Nicola Salvi under Pope Clement XII. And that's a significant symbol of the city. Um, it's the top free attraction drawing in approximately 1,200 people to the site every hour. And if you go in tourist season, prepare to be in a packed jam of people. And of course, uh, the ritual coin toss for good luck, um, everyone still does that to this day. So it makes a little extra revenue for Rome, so take your chance and throw your coin in.